$1.22 plastic shower curtain. A 1999 pair of shoes. They're both made of a material known as vinyl chloride. A 79 cent can of household disinfectant. Vinyl chloride is what makes it squirt. A $2.10 pair of barbecue gloves. It's the fire resistant asbestos inside them that keeps the hot coals from burning through. But the question is, what does all of this cost in the health and lives of the people who manufacture it for us? Good evening. I'm Jim Lehrer. There are stacks of federal rules and regulations designed to make various occupations safe. Most of these precautions have to do with underground mines, the wearing of hard hats on construction sites, rest time for inner city bus and truck drivers, and so on, the obvious well-known hazard. But now the federal regulators in Washington, as well as a huge segment of America's workforce, are confronting in headline fashion insidious dangers for which the rule books are still being written. The dangers are deadly diseases such as cancer, and the simple act of being on the job is all it takes to be a potential victim. Sometimes it takes 10 or 20 years to even develop the symptoms. It's a grim story, one that is tangled in lawsuits, conflicting medical arguments, labor management negotiations, as well as controversies over the zeal and competence of the federal agencies responsible. Tonight, we're going to zero in on two specific dramas, one involving asbestos in East Texas and the other vinyl chloride in upstate New York. First to Texas and to our report produced in association with KERA-TV Dallas. It opens in a graveyard. A small cemetery in Tyler, Texas, 10 days ago. Inside this tent, doctors and assistants conducting an autopsy on the exhumed body of Mitchell Walker. It was an initial step in a $100 million federal lawsuit involving, among other things, whether or not Walker, who died five months ago, was killed by his occupation. Breathing in asbestos fibers for 10 years as he made pipe insulation at the now-closed Pittsburgh Corning Company plant in Tyler. The deaths of Walker and two other former plant employees, Chester Hickman and Robert Thomas, are at the center of the controversy. All three had respiratory lung problems listed as one cause of death. Was asbestos the killer in the final form of cancer or asbestosis, a dreaded lung disease similar to cancer? Their survivors and a group of some 50 former workers still alive say yes, and thus the autopsy and this and companion lawsuits. Among the 50 are men like Arthur Bearden. He has asbestosis and he'll never work again. Same for Frank Spencer, who worked in asbestos plants for 21 years. His 31-year-old son, Kenneth, has thyroid cancer. Herman Yandel and his brother, J.C., both put in more than 10 years with a Tyler company. Come on. Herman has been diagnosed as having asbestosis. And this is Willie Hurt, a 59-year-old former asbestos plant worker who thinks he's dying, but won't go to a doctor to find out. I tell you, that stuff causes cancer. I don't care about knowing if I've, I've got one. Bob Ray Sanders of KERA-TV Dallas asked Frank Spencer how he thinks asbestos has affected him. Well, I don't know. I been all down and out ever since 69 there and just eat up I guess what they call it I don't know doctors we went to I, I went to my doctor he found out that my lungs was all eat up and stuff like that was no cure in the world for um, I don't know what would you compare it to well, I know it's about it didn't breathe so much of that old dust because it's dust you take and 
pull it out of your nose when you're around in the buildings in there. When you're eating, it's just like a fog all the time. They never did have no ventilation through there, and that's my kid. More than 850 people worked at the Tyler plant in its 18-year history. None of them apparently realized that asbestos, a mineral imported from Africa, was even an enemy, although they now claim the company and the government knew for five years before they were told. That is another key issue of the lawsuit. When did the workers find oh, out? Well, we really didn't know that till, oh, when was that? I mean, it's it when 71, last 71. It was long about the last November. So yeah, long. real, real, just before the plant closed down, before they come out and really told us, that we really found out. Dr. Grant admitted that he knew it since 63, I believe it. Some, somebody said he made a statement. Who but, did? Now, he, he didn't tell us that. Who well, did? He had a meeting up there and, and did say that he knew they was dangerous since 63. Well, yeah, he, Dr. He, Lee Grant, a defendant in the suit, is the company's physician in Pittsburgh. He denies these charges. They would never tell us nothing. We could go up there in a meeting and ask about these tests at the run, and oh, we would get everything checked out all right. The dust level was real low. A former plant manager who still lives in Tyler, Charles Van Horn, had agreed to comment on what he knew and when. But when a KERA film crew arrived, they found this note saying Van Horn, now a trade association employee, had decided against the interview because it might jeopardize his old company's legal position. The Pittsburgh Corning Company itself also declined comment on film or otherwise because of the lawsuit. They and Dr. Grant have denied all negligence, however, in official court papers. Do you think the company's to blame? Oh, I, I feel like you are. I really hold it against them myself for not telling it. Even a secret from that many people working in the plant, yeah. And I do, because we tried in some negotiation to get something done about the dust level, and they kept telling us it wouldn't hurt us, you know. It, it was all right. Well, we, we, we really had a feeling that it was, but, you know, we didn't know that it was that bad condition, health hazard. And even we'd go to them and ask and talk to them about it, and they would just sit there and lie to you for years. That's the bad part about it. For years, they were sitting and lie about it. The longer I stayed, it was harder for me to breathe, but you get stopped up your nose and all. It was, every day, you, you could tell you were taking on a lot of dust and that stuff. Then they come in there with a mask and forcing everybody to wear them. And, and up to then, it, it didn't hurt nobody, they claimed. The plant closed in February 1972 after the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health said dust levels far exceeded the safety level of 12 fibers per cubic centimeter of air. In one area of the plant, the level was as high as 208 per cubic centimeter. In 1967, the government found similar violations, but officials say they weren't aware then of the true dangers of asbestos. In December 1971, the company was fined $210 for violations $6,990 the next month for non-compliance, and the plant shut down. Buried underneath this earth is what's left of the gutted remnants of the plant, dismantled equipment and asbestos fibers. The idea was to protect the people of Tyler from the deadly material. In a separate project, unrelated to the lawsuit, the East Texas Chest Institute in Tyler is trying to find, test, and treat all of the plant's former workers. Thus far, only 17 have been checked. Eight were found to have asbestosis. Frank Spencer was one of those eight. I guess it's like a man taking the gun and shooting to the side and just dying a little all the time. No, if I was to give it up, heck, I'd have done been dead, I guess, two or three years ago. I'd just been a fighting it all the time. Frank Spencer says he's fighting, fighting asbestosis for his life. But he's also fighting in that massive class action civil lawsuit filed four months ago in a Tyler federal district court. It will be months, possibly years, before it and a host of separate individual suits brought by other former workers and survivors are ultimately resolved. While our film necessarily showed mostly the workers' view of it, the Pittsburgh Corning Company, Dr. Grant, and the other defendants in the suit will get their public day in court as the litigation moves along. They elected not to make statements to us for this broadcast. 
But it should be noted and emphasized that in these official court answers, the company, Dr. Grant and others concerned, categorically deny negligence of the company in the deaths and illness of its former employees. The key research in the field of occupational hazards of chemicals has been conducted by Dr. Irving Silikoff of New York's Mount Sinai Hospital. It is very likely that Dr. Silikoff will testify in the Tyler lawsuits. Impact's Peter Kay talked with him about the asbestos situation as well as the newest headline-making scare involving liver cancer and vinyl chloride. Dr. Silikoff summarized research he did on asbestos workers 20 years ago before the plant was moved from New Jersey to Tyler, Texas. One out of every uh, five of these men tends to die of lung cancer. There have been many cancers, about three times as many as we expect of the stomach, colon, rectum. There have been cancers of the abdomen and chest called mesothelioma and so forth. When the plant moved to Texas, they didn't leave behind the hazard. They took it with them. Well, why wasn't something done about it? Why weren't standards set and then enforced? I can't tell you why. It's just a tragedy in terms of perhaps hundreds of lives that the information that was being gathered, that was known, was not utilized. After all, we've known since 1924 that breathing asbestos can kill you. What do you think the standard should be as far as asbestos fibers are concerned? I don't know what the standard should be. I do know that the standard was set by the Department of Labor a year and a half ago, and we know that it's totally uh, inadequate, certainly inadequate to protect the health of workers. I suspect that one of the true answers has got to be that no exposure of working people to this dust that can cause disease and can cause cancer should be tolerated if there's any way whatsoever to prevent it. Not one fiber should be in the air that a working man breathes if, it, if there's an engineering way of preventing this. And there are many engineering ways are they expensive? Yes, they may be expensive, but so is losing a life. Let's talk about another form of cancer, liver cancer. There's been some evidence that a rare form of liver cancer is caused by exposure to vinyl chloride. Yes, yes. Uh, the kind of cancer that has been found among men uh, making polyvinyl chloride out of vinyl chloride has a very unusual name. It's called hemangiosarcoma of the liver. That's very, very rare. At the American Cancer Society, their recent review of 78,000 consecutive deaths in their files showed only one to be due to hemangiosarcoma of the liver. Very rare disease. And yet, in one factory uh, making this material in Kentucky, uh, there have been seven in a small group of some 250 people now working and their former workers there so that there is clear evidence that this otherwise rare cancer is found among people who are exposed to vinyl chloride uh, in the manufacture of the plastic. We're worried about the possible danger to workers who are using it in a form where they can uh, inhale it or even ingest it. Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company employs 438 workers at this chemical plant in Niagara Falls, New York. Three shifts a day, seven days a week for the last 27 years, they have gone to work in the plant. Here they convert the gaseous chemical, vinyl chloride, into a powdery resin that is the basis of a multi-billion dollar plastics industry. Thousands of consumer products from flooring to butter wrapping, are made from polyvinyl chloride. And at least 6% of the chemical used each year is lost into the environment. Neither the plant manager at Niagara Falls nor Goodyear Corporation officials in Akron, Ohio, would permit us inside this fence. But one worker gave this account of his job. It's very unpleasant in the sense of working conditions, especially where I work. There's a lot of spillages, aniline oils and stuff. And Fumes always coming out of reactors, and the ventilation is poor, very poor. Dust is bad, to the points where you just have to clear the building. 
sometimes you have to shut down the process just you get chemical reactions in the air with different chemicals that are going into the sewers and they react in the sewers and the fumes just fill up the air work in a chemical plant traditionally is unpleasant and dangerous but no one was aware of the cancer peril until the first four cases were reported recently from a bf goodrich plant in louisville kentucky then the oil chemical and atomic workers local 8277 at the Niagara Falls Goodyear plant reacted. President Frank McCauley. The union committee met right away and we called our international, the OCAW, and made arrangements for Mount Sinai Hospital people to come down and check our employees at the plant. Fourteen members of the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City, led by Dr. Selikoff, set up a makeshift medical clinic in the union hall. For four days, the medical team conducted exhaustive tests on 401 past and present workers at the plant. How old are you, Mr. Blanchard? 52. Mr. Blanchard, you're going to breathe through this tube. We first want you to take a deep breath all the way in. Then we want you to put your lips around this tube and blow all the way out until nothing more comes out. I'll hold this tube for you. OK, are we set? Nine inches tall. Okay. Deep breath all the way in, 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 in. Put your lips around that tube and blow. Keep blowing, keep blowing. Don't stop. Blow, 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 blow. Keep going, 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 keep, 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 keep. Okay, that was fine. All right, let's print. Now we're going to look at the information we have and see whether any other tests are necessary. Now we have some evidence here that there's obstruction to flow of air and we really should continue with some further testing. One of the important part of this examination is to check your liver and your spleen. Normally a doctor just puts his hand on your tummy and feels them, but I'm actually going to measure them so that we have a statistical way of analyzing the information we get from studying all you people when we get home. Okay, so. Okay. The lungs, liver, and spleen received particular attention. These tests still are being evaluated. But a check of past records reveals that at least three Goodyear workers have died from this rare form of liver cancer. Doctors also have found serious circulatory ailments in the fingers and toes of some of these men. It tingled very sorely after a period of a year or so. Each one would tingle very badly, like I couldn't touch nothing with it. Did you ever notice that your nails were changing their form? I did notice it from my thumbs, and then these gradually went, gotten worse as they went along. Workers endured their physical stoically, with apprehension but no panic. Despite a company pledge to install $1 million in safety equipment, there were persistent rumors among workers that Goodyear might instead close the Niagara Falls plant. Uh, we're in a position now where uh, if they're going to move, let them move, because, I mean, it's... When you start talking about cancer, you're scaring people, and uh, if the company's threatening to move, they haven't, but if they do, uh, just say goodbye to them, because, I mean, it's, it's lives now. We're not playing around with little dust problems. We're talking about cancer, and when you mention cancer to people, it's something that's final. What Frank McCauley and other workers want is some assurance from government and from industry that they can keep their jobs without peril to their lives. To help me discuss this and other occupational health issues, our Congressman William Steiger of Wisconsin, the co-author of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, and Dr. Marcus Key, the director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Dr. Key, uh, on the subject of vinyl chloride, what is your agency and the Occupational Safety and Health Agency itself doing to protect these workers? Both uh, OSHA in the Department of Labor and NIOSH and HEW regard occupational cancer is one of the most serious occupational health problems we have to face. OSHA has um, promulgated an emergency standard of some 50 parts per million to control exposure to vinyl chloride. We in HEW have recommended a more stringent work practices standard with uh, requirements for environmental and medical monitoring. This would be uh, uh, proposed as a permanent standard to replace the emergency standard. 
which, uh, as I understand it, might get the uh, level down to one part per million. That's approximately correct. Tell me, for years uh, after the uh, establishment of your uh, agency and of OSHA, there was a 500 parts per million standard set for vinyl chloride. How was that standard arrived at? Oh, it was set primarily on the basis of the anesthetic effects um, of vinyl chloride. Uh, in fact, vinyl chloride has been used uh, as an anesthetic agent in the past. Okay, but no thought was given of it as a carcinogen, as a cancer no, causing. No, there's no no formal procedure for reviewing all of the chemical substances that have some notation of um, of tumor producing ability. In fact, in the list of um, toxic substances, which we in NIOSH have a responsibility of publishing annually, there are some uh, 600 references to some kind of, uh, of tumor production. Doesn't this bother you? Doesn't you think this is a weakness? Yes, uh, it is a weakness. Uh, um, we would like very much to have a, a mechanism in place to review these, these new materials uh, before they're introduced to the market. The Toxic Substances Control Act would, would take care of that. So have a little perspective on this, Peter, if I can. You know, we have, since the passage of OSHA in, in 1970, suddenly seen in, in a three-year period of time what we knew would be seen. That is, that suddenly we would be confronted, particularly in the health field, with the development of all kinds of new substances that we hadn't thought about before or the understanding of the impact of substances like asbestos that had been used in the workplace for generations. The act gives both labor and management for the first time in the history of this country a mechanism in which to deal with these kinds of difficult areas. But ASHA, if we didn't have it, you'd still be dealing with Tyler, Texas or, or with vinyl chloride in the old way that you did before, which in effect was deni to deny that there ever was a problem and not have anybody looking at it. Now at least I think we have established that somebody has some responsibility and that the combination of what Dr. Key and NIOSH are doing and what the Department of Labor is doing will over a period of time and not overnight give you some way to deal with these kinds of incredibly complicated substances. But the burden of investigation to find out the causes of these and of enforcement still falls on industry and on labor because there are neither enough uh, inspectors in OSHA or apparently enough uh, medical facilities in NIOSH to discover all these well, things. Well, the burden is, I'm not sure I'd agree with you that the burden is limited just to industry and, and labor, because I think it is, a, it is a tripartite burden that is shared between government, industry, and labor. But if I could, let me suggest to you that um, what you're going to, in my judgment at least, what you're going to begin to see is more of what happened in, in, the, in the vinyl chloride situation that a company in this instance, if I, if I know my facts correctly, in, 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 in essence, took the lead in saying, look, we're beginning to find this problem. With the cooperation then of NIOSH that came in to do the health hazard survey and the kind of work that NIOSH did, and the cooperation of the labor union involved, undertook a tremendously important step in how they dealt with a very serious cancer-producing type of substance. So, somebody, a lot of somebodies have got to get with it, and get with it fast before more tragedies strike. There must be properly funded research, inspection, and enforcement from the federal agencies involved, and in the private sector as well. And there has just got to be a better dissemination of the information once we get it. A quick story. Thirteen years ago, the Dow Chemical Company, acting responsibly on its own, ran tests at one of its vinyl chloride plants that discovered the dangers and immediate safety and precautionary measures were taken. And there have been no tragedies at Dow vinyl chloride plants. The question is why Dow's information was not acted upon by the government in applying it to other companies making similar products. When we asked about this, a government spokesman said, we blew it. Well, we can't afford to blow any more. As Dr. Silikoff says, we are now reaping the environmental effects of the Industrial Revolution. He and others estimate that 85% of all cancer is caused by environmental factors. Now that includes smoking cigarettes, of course, but it may also mean for some 
just working for a living. And it's really tough to quit working cold turkey. Yours and my stake in this, regardless of what we do for a living, has one final P.S. This is that household disinfectant with a vinyl chloride propeller. The Environmental Protection Agency here in Washington just last week asked the manufacturers of 23 types of aerosol sprays to take their products off the market because of the potential vinyl chloride danger. But the EPA declined to tell us their brand names. An EPA man told NPAC's Kathy Test that it wouldn't be fair to the manufacturers. It might bankrupt them. To repeat, there are a lot of somebodies who need to get with it. Another Washington connection, Paul. This one, one that could affect our health. And there's still another connection, Jim, which affects us all in the pocketbook, and that, of course, is taxes. With the deadline for income tax payments now upon us, we'd like to offer some new revelations. James Davidson, director of the National Taxpayers Union, has made a study and has come up with some classic examples. For instance, did you know that we're footing a $35,000 bill for one year of chasing wild boars in Pakistan? or that $70,000 is being used to study the smell of perspiration given off by the Australian Aborigines? No doubt some of this money could have been saved on the project if only the State Department had prevailed upon Turkey to lend the Australians an odor measuring machine which we purchased for $28,000. Morocco's economy got an unexpected boost in the form of a potato chip machine that cost $37,000. All the Moroccans needed now are some potatoes. Besides all this, $20,000 was spent to learn all there is to know about the mating calls of Central American toads. The toads' problems were only one-tenth as pressing as those of Los Angeles, which received $204,000 to extend travelers' aid to migrants lost on the freeways. If you don't find any of this funny, Jim, let me remind you that in addition to being tax-paying time, this is also National Laugh Week. Okay, Paul. There'll be no laughs here next week, though. It'll be Energy Chief William Simon, your questions, and his answers. You still have time to send us your questions for our experimental program. Our address, Washington Connection, Box 300, Washington, D.C., 20044. Until then, for Impact, I'm Jim Lara. Thank you, and good night. possible by a grant from the Ford Foundation. This has been a production of MPAC, a division of the Greater Washington Educational Telecommunications Association.